if you ask or if you use the word Benjamin laryngoscope, it's a bit vague and woolly because there are about 10 Benjamin laryngoscopes and there are all sorts of other bits of kit with his name on too. The, the, the two you will probably know are the Benjamin Lindholm and the Benjamin Parsons. There's a slim line, a subglossoscope, there's all sorts of Benjamin scopes. Uh, right, so I'm going to do a quick preamble about intubation trauma. It results as uh, it comes as a result of pressure from the endotracheal tube. And if it's pressing too hard, you get reduced capillary perfusion in the mucosa. You then get ischemia. You then get swelling and edema. Eventually, you get mucosal ulceration. And after a while, it'll break down to underlying perichondritis in the cartilage below it, and then cartilage necrosis. So that's how it happens. Um, and then as it attempts to heal itself up, it can heal either by forming granulation, and this is actually an adult larynx, but these are the classic tongues of granulation that you get over the vocal process of the arotenoid, and a lovely sluffy ulcer at the posterior commissure there from pressure necrosis. Um, and the other thing that it will do as it heals up is cause fibrous tissue and scarring and scar formation. So this is a fairly classic posterior glottic web as a result of scarring. Now the, in the adult, the glottis is the narrowest part of the airway, uh, and these are the bits that tend to get pressed on. In a child, classically the subglottis is the smallest bit, so we tend to get more subglottic stenosis, and that's a fairly textbook picture of a nice subglottic stenosis. But of course, children get both sorts, they're mixed, they can be glottic, subglottic, or both, they can be hard, soft, inflammatory, so that, that it's quite a, a wide field. The other thing that uh, we were discussing just before we came on air is, um, is subglottic cysts, which appear to be particularly common in Manchester uh, for some reason, but they, they are an increasingly common uh, function of, um, uh, of intubation trauma um, in neonates particularly. Um, and it's as a result, I presume, of the endotracheal tube blocking up one of the glands in the in the mucosa and it forming a cyst but they form uh, beautiful well beautiful pictures and nice bit of airway obstruction too so uh, right so extubation failure let's define it that's we've got an intubated child the child gets an intubation injury which leads to one or more of the following edema granulation and scarring in the glottis and subglottis and as a result, when they pull the tube out, the airway is obstructed and the child can't breathe, has stride, and they have to reintubate it. It's a fairly common scenario uh, for most people working in children's hospitals. But of course, it is also a problem in DGHs, anywhere that has a neonatal uh, unit with small babies on it. it. It is potentially a problem for you. So in a nutshell, what can you do with it? Um, number one, reintubate it send it to somebody else um, which which is the runaway option which is actually i'm not, I'm not being funny it's a perfectly reasonable option if you work in a small unit you you reintubate them and get them transferred intubated to your local center of excellence unfortunately uh for us on the panel uh reintubating and running away isn't the option because we're supposed to be the center of excellence so the all the options available to us are a bit of medical treatment and then try again a few days later do something endoscopic, and we'll come on to those later on. That could be all sorts of things. Do something open, and we'll come on to that later. Or just go for tracheostomy, uh, which is, of course, the, the, the definite final solution to extubation failure. But it's quite a big step that we try to avoid if we can. Um, good. Now we seem to have absolutely no more slides, which is a bit of a shock. I'll just mention while Hannah's doing that, that that yeah. classical appearance of the heaped up edema in, around the endotracheal tube, uh, Peter Bull, my mentor, used to call those the seal flippers because uh, he figured they, they look a lot like seal flippers and he, uh, he put it in his, in his textbook. But um, that's a really classical appearance. And uh, um, if you see that, and that, that appearance can, I've seen that after 48 hours of intubation. And if you've got that appearance um, when you take the tube out, then um, yeah. What do you do with those, Ravi? Do you do you always take them off? Do you never take them off? Do you what do you what do you take? Well, I think we're gonna we're gonna get into this in a in a bit, but you, you kind of eyeball this, and and you know sometimes they're kind of pedicled, and you feel as if you're just gonna grab it, and something's gonna <laughs> come away in your hands, and it's gonna it it's gonna be great. And mm -hmm. other times uh, you get this more diffuse kind of edema, and you you feel like you know. Uh, you're just not getting anywhere with anything you do to it. Anything you do makes it a bit worse. So it's kind of a judgment call on those. Um, uh, yeah, you, you kind of have to imagine 
I think what I do in my mind's eye is I kind of imagine what the maneuver I'm going to do is likely to achieve and then think to myself, is that going to um, improve the appearance of the airway? So, um, so I've got a couple of cases that we've seen in the last um, month, um, which aren't technically failed extubation. Um, they might more technically be failed ventilation, but uh, for whatever reason, they thought ENT might be useful. Um, so I suppose um, these are just kind of interesting little cases that uh, would be interesting to see what everyone else thought about this. I'm sure everyone in a tertiary hospital has come across this, um, you know, these calls from intensive care, NICUs and PICUs, where you go, really, oh, I'm not quite sure if that's, our, that's really our problem, but for some reason they think ENT can fix everything, um, and maybe we can. Um, so this was the first little one that we had uh, about uh, six weeks ago, a term baby born elsewhere, um, small baby, only 1.8 kilos, poor at gars at birth, needed resuscitation, Apparently a difficult intubation, but someone got a size 3 tube in. They were then transferred to a NICU, which wasn't in our centre. Um, and within the day, someone had decided they had pulmonary hypertension and the cardiac surgeons got involved. Um, and in order to get that child to our PICU, or our cardiothoracic team, to look after them, they were put onto VV ECMO. Uh, so some very big catheters put into this tiny baby's chest and transferred to our PICU. Now, I don't know much about pulmonary hypertension, but apparently it can get better. You put them on ECMO for a while and it gets better and you can extubate them. That's what our cardiothoracic team thought anyway. Uh, the child was mildly dysmorphic, but normal genetics. Um, very challenging family situation. In fact, I still haven't met this family's parents at all. Um, and the child was on ongoing ECMO, but they're also ventilating by this three tube um, uh, orally as well. And some over the days till we got to know them, the tube had been changed a number of times and no one had reported that the tube change was problematic at all. Uh, day five, uh, we were asked to review because they couldn't suction down the tube and they weren't ventilating the right lobe very well and there was collapse on that side. Um, I was stuck in clinic um, and it was gonna be a couple of hours till I could kind of get up to clinic and there was obviously nothing urgent there. Um, so I thought a scan would be a reasonable idea. I don't know what everyone else would have done, but I thought, send the baby to the CT scan. It doesn't really sound like a hugely ENT issue. Um, and, off, and off it went. And I'm not sure if, how well people can see that, but uh, anyone want to comment on anything they can see there? Throw it out there. Got a tube that's a long way down. They did push it down quite well. But at the bottom end of the tube, it gets kind of narrow. In fact, um, on the axial, um, that was kind of like two mils at best at the end of the tube. So on this uh, image on the right-hand side. Um, so, and it's suspicious of uh, complete tracheal rings. Um, what would any, anyone else, what would you guys done next? Anyone? Hannah, can I, can I just ask, why, why were they changing the tube so much? Good question. Good question. I think because they weren't ventilating that well, so everyone thought, oh, we'll just, we'll just change the tube again. It must be something to do with the tube. Okay. Yeah. Um, good question. There was a lot of unanswered questions about this baby and even the fact it ended up on ECMO because it didn't really qualify at its size for ECMO. So It sounds like, it sounds like the, the tube is right at the tracheal stenosis and it's probably caused some edema and swelling that's led to further narrowing. So obviously the complete tracheal ring will need to, to be dealt with at some point, but you may be able to get some steroid in there to reduce some of that swelling. It's difficult to know what's, what's you know, fixed and what's, um, mm. what's soft. Yeah, yeah. So we, we definitely thought we, we should go and have a little look. The baby was an ECMO, so it was pretty easy to take this baby to theatre and, um, and do an airway examination. Um, you know, don't have to worry about ventilation when they're on ECMO. Um, and, and I can show this video. There's nothing particularly subtle about this. <laughs> so... Dormatised. <laughs> <laughs> counting rings, I think I think I counted about six rings there that they managed to rupture. 
Hannah, it's nice to start with the easy cases, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely fabulous. Yeah, I thought I'd just jump in with these. <laughs> right. Okay. And this is a 1.8 scope. So the, there were complete rings at the bottom of the stenosis. You could get through with a 1.8 scope. And then there was normal trachea, um, probably for the distal third, for about one and a half centimetres below that. Wow. And interestingly, no sub-Q emphysema on the scan or... Okay. No, never have had subcutaneous emphysema. Maybe because the, tight, the tube was so tight yeah. um, down there. Maybe because they weren't ventilating strongly because they were also on ECMO. Oh. Um, no, I'd be interested in what would you guys have done then? I kind of looked at that and went, ooh. That's uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I'll start. I think I would call the thoracic surgeons. Uh, they were standing over my shoulder. They were standing over my shoulder going, hmm. Oh. Interesting. <laughs> well, I suppose, I mean, I haven't dealt with a lot of these, to be honest. I'd, I'd probably, uh, the options are to, to open the chest, I suppose, and, and, and try and repair it from the outside, or if it's ventilating and stable, see if it walls off on its own. I mean, you know, mm. we, we don't do a lot of lower tracheal stuff, so I'd probably be on the phone to Richard Hewitt at Great Ormond Street. I don't know um, what anybody else would think. Uh, Ravi? Mm. Sound, Ravi? You said, Ravi? Yeah, sorry. It really depends on how that left, left lung is doing and how, you, you know, if, yeah. if I think you could get away with a tube, um, provide, you know, you could, get, you could have got in there and maybe given it a bit of a clean out and a wash out and then put a tube into this gap and then kept them on ECMO and then just, uh, if the lung starts to reinflate, then I think you've got a good chance that you might get away with it. But I certainly would run it past my cardiothoracic buddies um, yeah. to see what they thought. We, we don't really do slides in our centre. They all get sent down south. So, um, you know, a lot of this was very theoretical. Um, they were kind of interested, but uh, we decided we'd, we'd, we'd see uh, this had, hadn't caused any problems. So we thought I couldn't get a three tube, I couldn't get a two and a half tube through the stenosis at this stage. So I sat a three tube sitting at the stenosis with the bevel over the top of that tear. Um, and we were able to ventilate both lobes if you set the tube in the right position so um, we'll just sit with that for a few days um and then went back the next week um and had a look and it was starting to heal up and we all then could squeeze a two and a half through the stenosis so opted to put a two and a half tube through the stenosis so they could ventilate both sides a little more stably um and that's kind of where we're sitting we've managed to get the child off ecmo but we can't get it off the oscillator and bottom line is this kid's got crappy lungs and uh, probably will go palliative in the end of the day anyway. Um, but I suppose a bit of a cautionary tale for pushing tubes too hard wow. <laughs> um, to our, to, you know, all our colleagues. Uh, but I've certainly never seen that happen before. No, no. I mean, it and it's interesting, isn't it? They were on ECMO because if they weren't, then they would have really struggled with their ventilation. You would have thought so, yeah, yeah. Interesting, we found one paper from Korea who, um, of a patient who was treated with complete tracheal rings, long tracheal rings, the family refused um, uh, an open approach, and the Kore Korean team endoscopically divided the balloons segment by segment with a balloon over a period of a couple of weeks and managed to split them all, and the child survived. So one of our thoughts was we could try to split those last couple of rings with a balloon endoscopically and... Uh, see how we went but I, I don't think we're going to get there because I think the child's going to be yeah uh, does it have a lot of other morbidity as well it looks mildly um, dysmorphic and Funny. the pulmonary yeah. hypertension I think the pulmonary hypertension yeah. is really a major big problem and the yeah. lung is not ventilating very well at all so, so the child uh, probably should never have got on ECMO in the first place and this probably should yeah. have been palliated from a very early age but very early time but ah. the fun, ah. funny things end up in your department sometimes yeah. Do you know if the child arrested at any point? Because typically <laughs> rings, rings are meant to do that, aren't they? If you start doing stuff to them, they can be pretty dramatic crashes yeah. and they manage to transect these rings. <laughs> it's sort of remarkable that they sort of almost got away with it to some extent. I suspect because they were on ECMO. Yeah, yeah, probably. Great. Hannah, uh, have you got another one you wanted to talk about or is that I've enough? Got, I've got one other little one and go uh, on. then... Yeah, go on. Okay. So the second one um, was a 30-week prem, um, born elsewhere also, um, intubated with a two-and-a-half tube elsewhere. 
and they weren't ventilating very well. And so we got a phone call over the phone saying, oh, what, what, what can we do? We can't ventilate this baby. And we're like, well, that's really not our problem either. Um, you've got a tube and I'm not quite sure what we have to offer, but um, why don't you scan the baby and see if there's anything funny in the lungs? Um, and once again, this is a spot diagnosis. Um, there was something funny in the lungs. Oh, can't work that out at all. Uh, so, so we've got tube, we've got collapsed yeah. lung, we've got a bit yeah. of consultation. There's something foreign. I don't yeah. know. Well, the thing that's horizontal, you mean? Yeah, the thing that's yeah. horizontal. <laughs> <laughs> Has anyone got any ideas what foreign body like could be in this child's Christmas lungs? Christmas BMJ, this one. I can't, I can't work this out at all. Yeah. No, no, I... The only thing this child has been done was intubated. Um, so Someone we took suggested it... it might be a bougie. Yeah, yeah. yeah? Um, so, yeah. so the child had to be transferred to our centre. And anyone who's done a, a scope on a 30-week prem knows that yeah. you, know, <laughs> and you can't get an optical grasper down the airway well. It's, yeah. it's very little you can do. Went into suspension. The child actually was able to be managed um, oxygenation-wise and high flow. Um, a little 1.8 scope down the lungs and down the trachea and a little optical grasper because six mil, a six centimetre oh. piece of the bougie, so the plastic oh. off the bougie. So um, did they notice that it was missing at the time that they... No, no. <laughs> oh, really? Slightly silly question, yeah. Uh, um, and we thought, oh, this is it. we'll write this up. This is unusual, yeah. but unfortunately, there's um, quite a few papers in the literature over the years of exactly this. Okay. Um, the little, yet the little uh, smaller stylet, uh, the plastic can come off if you push too yeah, hard. Yeah, I'm going to be around the corner. So uh, I'd like to start by asking Steve. Let's say you've been asked to go to NICU, and they say we've got a, I don't know, a 30 week tram that we that's failed extubation twice. And we'd like you to come and sort it out. What would you go to the ward and do anything? Is there anything much you'd do? Um, I I do like to go and actually have a, a good talk to the neonatologist or the intensivist. I think it's really important to kind of get a grip on what's happening with the child overall. I think um, yeah, because there's lots of reason these kids fail ventilation, and sometimes it's a little bit speculative about whether it's the airway or yeah. whether it's the chest. And I think it's it's really helpful. We've got one on the go at the moment, an X27 weaker who's going to go to theatre, just keep failing, but we don't really know one of these mixed failure pictures. So we do get a lot of mileage out of actually going and sitting down with the neonatologist going through it. So I, I think it is worth it um, and, and actually sort of gearing yourself up for what you might find um, and likelihood of success given the chest and, and the other things, I think. Yeah. Um... Ravi, any other thoughts? I mean, my, my experience is these kids have been pretty well worked up already. They've had chest x-rays and all the bloods. And they've usually had an echo and so on. Yeah, no, but I'll just echo what Mike said. I think that trying to get a handle on what's actually happened, um, I, I, I do feel that it, it tends to, it should be the, I, I, I use this term, it's a bit derogatory, but I think it should be the grown-ups who talk about what's happened to this kid up to that point. Um, often in the with the older kids, it, you know, on a strong history, I I won't really see them. I'll I'll I'll, I'll say yes, book them for theatre. But the, these neonate, these little tiny babies, you know, taking them to theatre, it's quite a big step. You know, it's there's a lot that can go wrong with them. Um, and so I just really, it's it's really about talk senior people talking about what has actually happened up to that point, um, because uh, things really get lost in translation. How they actually failed. If they were a difficult intubation, were they really a difficult intubation, or was it um, relatively junior people doing that intubation? Was there a lot of trauma that happened during that intubation? All the other stuff, of course, which I, I presume we're going to talk about, like what's their oxygen requirement, all, okay. uh, what tube have they got in, are they leaking around the tube? Those things, of course, uh, uh, play a big role in, in in our understanding of, as Stephen says, what are we hoping to achieve? Um, the question they're asking us is, do we scope them? And um, okay. the question is, what can we achieve with that? They don't, yes, I think I mean, they, they don't always, the, they don't always the, present here whether... Lesion. Yeah. I was going to say, um, Hannah, um, say you've decided that you've agreed with the neonatologist or the intensivist that you're going to take a child to theatre who's, who's intubated and has failed extubation twice. Once you have the child in theatre, let's say they've got an endotracheal tube down, what, what do you do next exactly? How, what instruments do you use? What's your, what's your technique? Um, 
Gen well, with a good anaesthetist as well, because you have to, you know, these yeah. kids often aren't easy to ventilate, aren't they? So you want kind of a good good team. Uh, I tend to use the Lindholm uh, laryngoscope in suspension with the Benjamin Havis light source on it, and I tend to leave the, the tube in while I set up. So uh, set up with the tube in situ um, and have a look around that tube first of all. Um, with a decision of how we're going to ventilate this child when we pull the tube out and in our centre that would often be with high flow but with a tube, a rescue tube available as well. Uh, making sure the child's spontaneously breathing often, sometimes they're not um, and it takes a while to get the child breathing again when you get to the theatre um, with some adrenaline available. So once they're spontaneously breathing and it's just really happy with them and you're in suspension with a good view of the larynx, pull out the tube um, and assess what you've got. Um, you know, and making sure you're assessing both structurally for uh, uh, for problems, but also for functional. You know, see if we can get cord movement on both sides. Yeah. Um, and dynamic assessment of the lower airways, if possible, um, and assessing uh, what what the abnormality, structural or functional, potentially is. Um, a lot of these babies have had P PDA repairs, so it's not unusual to find a vocal cord palsy, uh, yeah. which may just be the thing pushing them over the edge. Um, and even Laringa Malaysia uh, occasionally as well. Sometimes it's harder to assess in these little ones if you can't get a good functional view. I, I must say, I've, my experience is I find that they're often so full of clonidine and other things that it's very difficult to get a good, uh, a good look at their vocal cord movement because they're a bit mm. brittle and the needs just can't get them quite into the right place. Oh, um, right. I don't know. Um, anybody use flexible endoscopy in this scenario? Not particularly. I think yeah, probably. we well, we do actually. We tend to like most of them would get flexible at the same time if you know if we think we're going to get a, a, a dynamic use. So I think it I think it does change things in terms of the dynamic things. So once you get them on suspension, there's certain things that you you, you maybe won't appreciate the significance of as much. So we always try and do flexible at the same time and then suspend. Okay. And you have that going through a face mask, do you? With a, the anaesthetist just doing a bit of jaw thrust. Yeah. So. I yeah. I, ideally, so if, if we can get to that stage, we'd probably take the tube out with a Hopkins rod under direct vision in case there are any granulations that are about to slip into the airway. So we yeah. can zero down on that. But if there's no apparent immediate obstruction, probably then at that stage, once the tube's out, go to a flexi and then address with a suspension any uh, any abnormalities. Okay. Let's move on to um, let's move on to another slide then. Um, so let's, this is a very straightforward one. Um, I'll uh, just go back to Ravi, 10 year old child who is struggling with airway and saturations and has very quiet inspiratory strider, but it's not very clear cut, slightly dysmorphic. There has been a suspicion that there's unilateral coronal atresia because people are struggling to get a, uh, a nasogastric through tube through one side. Uh, but in fact, you, you find that when you look in the nose, um, it's just quite marked neonatal rhinitis, which of course might explain uh, quite a lot of the problems the child's having with, with its airway. And these are the findings when you look at the larynx. Um, so there's, there's, you know, this is mild intubation trauma. Uh, the, you know, the, let's say the cords are mobile. I can't tell you that because it's not on this picture, but there's just edema all over the place here. Would you do anything about that, Ravi? Sorry, I just uh, I didn't quite get the history of how this child ended up on your operating table. Had they been intubated at birth? <laughs> okay, sorry, it's a slightly vague history. The child is dysmorphic, a little bit complex. It's it's desaturating quite regularly. Um, it has been noted to have strider from time to time and some recession. Um, so there appears to be airway obstruction. Um, but the picture isn't clear-cut absolute strider. There's some strider, there's a query of, of a unilateral coronal atresia, although I didn't go up there myself and stick a scope in. Um, but, but, but the child had been intubated at some point, I missed that. Uh, yes, I'm sorry, it had been intubated in the first couple of days. I'm so sorry, I didn't mention that. Yeah. Okay, fine. So intubated first couple of days because of airway uh, problems at birth? Yes, exactly. And it's been extubated. It's kind of just been not quite right since. Fine. Okay. Um, and so, I mean, looking okay. at the larynx there, if you ignore everything else, what do you think of that larynx? Yeah, just You're run fine. the video again. I was still trying to figure out why he had intubation trauma, but... Yeah, yeah. Pardon me. There are no tricks here, Ravi. I keep saying that. <laughs> <laughs> 
I mean, do you think that's even yeah. significant? Sorry, say that again? Do you think that's even significant as intubation trauma goes? Uh, no, no, that, that, that's pretty good, actually, all things considered. Um, so, no, I think that's not really his main problem. Uh, yeah. It might it might be a you know a, a contributory factor, uh, but you'll know that based on whether he's getting better or worse. I mean, if he yeah. was intubated and extubated a day two, and he is continuing to improve day by day, uh, then you can put that down to uh, resolving post intubation edema. Yeah. Uh, if he's getting worse over the over his eight days of unintubated life, then it seems likely that that's the main driver of why he's got a problem now. Yeah. And in fact, um, I, I would, you know, I don't think anybody else in the panel disagrees. That's that's mild intubation trauma. And in fact, he got a lot better when we stuck a nasopharyngeal prong in and sent him back extubated. And that was clearly that 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 was the the, the main point of that slide. Um, so let's move on uh, to the same child uh, a few months later. Uh, so there we are. There's, he comes back. He's now got more impressive strider six months later. Uh, and of course, his larynx is now pristine. So you can see that that sort of level of intubation trauma just resolves on its own. But what he did have at this point was a bilateral vocal cord palsy, which I hadn't been able to assess the first time, which goes back to that thing that I, was, I think Hannah or someone was saying about cord movement. Uh, and it can be a little bit tricky to see. Uh, right, another one here. Failed extubation on the neonatal unit again. Uh, I'm not giving you a lot of history, I'm sorry. Um, uh, Steve. Um, what, w without knowing much of the background, let's say it's a failed extubation, but there is a few pulmonary problems. Do you think that that larynx itself is enough to account for failed extubation? Um, well, probably not immediately, but depends on when they fail. So I think the things that we can say to so there is um, good cord movement. There was a bit of posterior. You can see a bit of posterior on the cricoid when you probably run the video again. Yeah. So obviously quite a bit of tracheobronchomalacia going on yeah trying to figure out whether that's a primary or secondary problem so we've got cord movements that's a positive and then you can just see posteriorly on the cricoid yeah. and sort of laterally on both sides so there's definitely been a bit of tube trauma there yeah um, exactly and, right. and, and everything's a little bit floppy so that's that's why i put this uh, that's why i put this particular video in because you can see those sort of ulcerated troughs on either side where the where the et tube has been now, uh, again, I think that, that that probably isn't his main problem. I think the main problem in that kid's, uh, in this child, was the lower airway and the lungs as well. That's just really a, a feature. Um, so, I, now another thing that's, uh, I've got a beer in my bonnet about cuffed ET tubes at the moment. Uh, this is another one with, that, that had uh, had problems after prolonged intubation with cuffed ET tube. And it seems to be an increasing fashion um, on our ITU to use cuffed ET tubes, although you know they, they did originally go out of fashion in the 1980s because they caused so much trouble. And and, it, and this particular one, you can see that, that there's granulation there. You can see a sort of bridge of of, of uh, edema there, and then a, a gap where the cuff's been sitting, and then another ridge below. You can see where that cuff has been sitting, and that that cuff has been too high, and the pressure hasn't been monitored enough. Um, do you in your units any of you have problems with cuffed tubes, or is it exclusive to Bristol? Ravi? It, it, yeah, so it, it looked a few years ago like cuff tubes were going to be a thing, and but they never yeah. really took off at Sheffield. Um, uh, the, I, I mean, intensivists like it, like them typically in the slightly older children, but by and large, um, we, we don't we don't tend to we don't really use them very much in definitely don't use them in the neonates. We definitely don't use them in the younger children. Obviously, the older children, two, three, and above, uh, PICUs tend to like them. Yeah. Um, Steve, you, do you have any experience of cuff tubes in small children? Yeah, so there was because the cardiac units, there's, there's quite a lot of kids who are fairly clapped out, so uh, needing high pressures, ventilation, LTB, all that sort of thing. Um, yeah. so, so, so we do see it, but I just think, I think the intensivists are onto it sort of pretty well, so that we're not actually seeing a whole lot of cuff trauma. We had one tracheal stenosis from cardio in the last couple of years, but but that was it, and 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 you know they tend to have the cuff position right, so it tends to be a tracheal issue, if anything. I think. Yeah, Hannah, do you have any? Do they use cuff tubes in in, uh, in Brisbane? Um, not in the NICU um, very often, what at all at all. PICU similarly cardiac wise, and, and the, the kind of long term ventilation uh, bubs was really bad. Air, low airways, they needing to ventilate potentially, but we haven't really seen a whole lot of problems. I'm glad to say um, with them. 
but I agree, they can sit at the wrong place and often the tube, the cuff seems to sit just below the vocal cords rather than further down. Rather than below the um, cord, yeah. Yeah, they seem to sit a bit high, don't they? Pull the tube up a bit high and the cuff's just sitting just below the vocal cords. I mean, we, Julian, it's my impression we had a, a run of these about a, three years ago, didn't we? Probably not even as long as that, but we had, we had a run where we, they would just seem to be cuff trauma after cuff trauma and I don't think they use a lot of cuffs I just think we had a run of them um, and the problem they had was just well the problem that we perceived was that they just weren't using the manometers uh, regularly enough so they were just you know whacking in as much pressure as they needed to prevent a leak but not necessarily really focusing on what the cuff pressure was and I think that was the, the our concern was that you know, these cuffs were such high pressure that they were they were definitely going to be causing trauma to the trachea. Yeah, uh, but but it did seem to be something that was a, a few years ago. And my impression is that they've they've learned the lesson and they found the manometers that were in the cupboard for ten years, mm -hmm. and now they're using them properly. Okay, now here is another one with a bit more history. Uh, this is a case of Julian's. Hannah, uh, I'll ask you about this one if that's okay. A twenty-five week exprem had been ventilated for, you know, four weeks, let's say, um, and was transferred from one of our outlying units with biphasic strider. It was very obstructed, seen by Julian, and he decided to take the child to theatre straight away. Um, and this is the diagnostic MLB. Sorry, it's a bit fuzzy. Can you see that okay? Yeah, it's all good. A little bit soft focus, as everything in Bristol is. Um, <laughs> Why seeing some cysts so often? Fabulous subglottic cysts. Yeah. Excellent. Aren't they yeah, fabulous. The grapes. This is always this always makes you feel good, doesn't it? Because you know you're going to be able to fix this fairly quickly, yeah. or at least short term yeah. fix them. Yeah. Um, That's coming. Yeah. So what would you do there? Yeah. Um, so I tend to use cold steel for this um, in suspension. Grasp them with a little pair of graspers and a little sharp pair of scissors and de-roof them. Um, uh, I know some of my colleagues use micro debrider, but I just tend to find the scissors and sharp dissection is the quickest, easiest thing to do uh, to de roof them. Yeah. And then, good look, because there's generally a degree of subglottic so stenosis associated with them, whether that's acquired or whether it's congenital and they've just had a yeah. too small tube down there. Um, they're usually better straight afterwards, but I've got a very low threshold to bring them back and have another look. Uh, within you know weeks because uh, sometimes they reoccur or another one pops up um, and it's also easier to reassess that subglottis uh, at a later date. In my experience generally they do very well as soon as you pop them and symptoms are a lot better uh, fairly quickly. Yeah, um, Ravi, what do you uh, what do you use to deal with these? Yeah, so I do. I prefer cold steel for them. You, you sort of pop them um, and try and um, remove a bit of the loose mucosa and then see how it looks. Uh, you can sometimes uh, balloon them. Um, I, I have had cases actually where uh, even after I've done them, uh, it, it, there's still not a great airway left at the end of that. Um, and so I have I've split a couple of babies uh, uh, endoscopically because I felt like I, I even after after taking the, the, the system, I didn't. I wasn't too keen on the airway, uh, but I agree with Hannah. I think they, they almost inevitably you you get a, a bit of a comeback from them, recurrence, and so yeah, I tend to scope them. I don't tend to do it within a week. I think usually if I've if I've got a good result, I'll leave it about four weeks, something like that. Um, but I think it is really worthwhile scheduling them in for a cold I scope. Agree with all of that, Steve. Cold steel, laser, coblation. Oh yeah, all of that. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, just just cold steel. I think yeah, Hannah and Ravi have got it spot on. So, you know, you, I don't think you need a powered instrument. The, the, the cysts come away beautifully, and you want to preserve as much mucosa that is good as possible. So, um, yeah, I think that's the way forward. Yeah, well, uh, so Julian likes to use cold steel as well. Um, and uh, here is the immediate post-operative result of it being very gently de-roofed, and you can see you've got a lovely airway there with maybe a tiny little bit of soft stenosis, uh, but, but not much else. And then a follow-up MLB three months later, uh, I think we probably would have gone sooner than three months. It's just we have a, a, a big pile of work, which has only just got bigger. So there's a, a, a little bit of a recurrence, but I think probably not enough to I do, I, do, yeah, I, 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 I snipped those as well. Oh, you did? <laughs> um, yeah, just because I, I just thought I should. 
Hard couldn't... to resist, hard to resist. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mas ma masterful, though, masterful appearance. <laughs> well, it went so well the first time, didn't it? <laughs> okay. But that was it. Once after the second one, it was it was done and dusted. I haven't done anything. I haven't looked down since, and, and he's asymptomatic. Okay, good. Personally, I'll, if I have time, I'll come into it. I like the micro debrider for those cases um, because I just like to get the uh, a little bit of the roof of the system bited off, and I like the fact that you're only putting one instrument down down between the cords, but it's very much personal preference. Does anybody worry about doing them on the, on both sides at the same time in case you get a synecchia across the middle? Has anybody, I've heard people talk about it, never seen it. No, no, clearly not, okay, <laughs> we'll move on. Okay, here's a newborn baby that was um, a fairly recent one of ours. Um, severe strider from birth and unilateral cerebellar hyperplasia noted on the antenatal scan, otherwise a normal looking baby. Um, and you know, to me that sounds like a vocal cord palsy um, because of the, the immediate severe strider straight from birth rather than laryngovalation which comes on more slowly. For various reasons, technically, we couldn't get a good view of the cords on the neonatal unit, but I was almost certain it had got uh, a bilateral cord palsy. Uh, arranged an MLB, um, in, within a few days, but over the weekend in between it had to get intubated because um, because the airway just went off really badly. Um, and uh, it didn't help that both of the parents were actually medics. So um, here is some intubation trauma. There's a, you can see a, a, a big ulcer there on the anterior wall where the tube tip's been. Um, you can see that there's sort of diffuse edema of the cords. Um, there you are, that, that, that looks like a bit of intubation trauma. Um, I won't ask Julian because he knows this one. Um, Ravi, would you, I mean, it, it, when we looked at the mobility of the cords, it was clearly a bilateral cord palsy. Do you think that intubation trauma is adding anything or it's just a, uh, an incidental finding? Um, that, yeah, I don't think it's huge. I mean, there's obviously some trauma yeah. anteriorly, uh, but with the view that I got, I. I I, yeah. I don't know that that's a, the main story. Not a great view, no. Um, well, I wasn't completely sure because at, at various stages in the baby's short existence, it had been absolutely fine. Um, and I wondered whether the whether the intubation trauma had, it was the thing that had tipped it over the edge because, you know, some babies with bilateral cord palsies can get away with it. So we gave it a big dose of steroids for a few days um, and it did get better and then it went off again and eventually kept going off, so we wound up with a tracheostomy. Um, yeah, so that's, I mean, that's just an incidental finding. So let's move on to another one. Three-month-old Exprem, again, a failed extubation. Um, actually, let's skip that one, because we're actually, is this your one, Julian? That was a lot of granulation. Right, let's, let's, let's watch this one. I'll let Julian talk you through this one. Uh, this is a, the, the typical scenario that we said about NICU patients, failed extubations, um, so you bring them to, to theatre, pull the tube, and and that's what I found. So I thought that would, well, I suppose we can ask the panel, what, what would you do at this point? You've, you've just literally taken the tube out in theatre. Um, what the, are you going to do? The distal next? airway was fine, by the way. We're not showing you the distal airway. This was purely glottic. Uh, granulation and edema. Hannah, oh. what would you do? I love a balloon, um, so I think you're going to need to get that airway pretty a little bit better fairly quickly because your needs is going to start struggling soon and your ventilation is going to be poor. Um, so I'd be fairly quick to put a balloon down, balloon all that out of the way, uh, make the airway at least temporarily better, and remove any granulation tissue. Um, uh probably put some steroid down inject some steroid uh perhaps put a bit of steroid put a tube back down again a smaller size tube surrounded in steroid and and give it a bit of uh laryngeal rest and come mm -hmm. back and look in um in a, a few days or a week's time what, to what see topical agent there. do you use hannah when you say surround steroid what topical oh, agent? Kenicone. 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 and I, i'd potentially also inject kenicort um, if I could get that in there, um, sometimes that's a bit hard in these little ones to get it yeah. anywhere. Uh, but a big blob of kenicomb around the tube, top of the tube is sometimes helpful. I don't think it hurts. Um, yeah, hmm. yeah oh. I agree. I learned, I mean, we, we both learned that from Mike Rothero in Manchester. Um, mm. 
and you know it's, you could just think of it as an alternative to using aqua gel on the tube it's not going to do mm. any damage and it might do a bit of good do, do you ravi steve do you do that either of you steve yeah yeah yeah, yeah. ravi do you use i mean I, there's no there's no uh, evidence say it one way or another but it's not going to do a great deal of damage Okay, Julian, would you like to tell us what you actually did here? Oh, I, I just snipped it out with scissors, actually, uh, just, just a bit like the subglottic cysts. I just thought it was amenable to to snip out, so I just snipped them out. A um, little bit bloody initially, but... Um, I'll move that Yeah, on, also it's keen to get there. The, the, the trouble I find with the neonates is that they, you know, they can desat really quickly. Um, obviously, they, they come up very quickly as well. And I suppose my concern with putting a balloon in is that you've already got a really poor airway, and then you're gonna you're gonna block it for a little bit longer with a balloon. So I wouldn't I wasn't sure how long I would actually have to deploy the balloon for. So um, so I thought mm -hmm. if I snip if even if I snip one side out, then I've improved the airway by say 20, 30 percent, and that might just give us a little bit more time. Um, and I think I was just sort of intubating and extubating during this as well, because you know she she would she would desat on occasion, so it it took a little bit of time, but I just ended up um, chopping them out to be honest. And I think that's the yeah, I think that's the end result. That's the end. So result. certainly, I I, I I don't surgically. Uh, remove granulations very much, but certainly, you know, occasionally you have those big what people call seal flaps on either vocal process where they really are obstructing. I'd certainly very carefully shave those out with the micro debrider. Um, Hannah, would you do the same thing? Have you ever, you ever removed granulations? Oh, absolutely. Um, if it's there, yeah. I'll remove it. Um, cold steel micro debrider, whatever kind of works on the day. Yeah, um, what's easy and close to hand. Um, sometimes it takes forever to get the micro debrider set up and it's just yeah. too slow, isn't it? And so... so this is me actually putting a little bit of steroid ointment over the tube and then putting it in just like you described, Hannah. Yeah, just like you described. So, uh, yeah, I must say, I, but th there you go, tube covered with steroid cream. So we, we've covered that slide already. We, we don't get Kenicomi. It's what we used to call tried cortal in the UK, but it's difficult to get hold of. We use... Um, what do we use? Um, anything, Cinelar. Yeah, Cinelar, hydrocortisone, any, any steroid cream we can find in the anaesthetic room. I have to say, though, do you mind if I just say, I, I really with, I'm with Hannah with this. I think that getting a balloon in really quickly, um, that view that you had right at the start, it's hard to tell what's what in that picture. Uh -huh. uh, I suspect the real world view might have been a bit better, but I really find that if you can get a balloon in, even if for 30 seconds, um, it just tells you where the main problem is a bit better, I think. And you've, yeah. just, you've just got a bit more time and a bit more leeway. Obviously, it's a bit hairy when that first balloon goes in uh, and everybody has to hold their nerve a bit. Um, and it's certainly better than, than putting the tube back in or putting another tube unless you downsize because there is a shearing trauma effect. But I, I really like using the balloon if I can get away with it right that first time. Then see what I've got. That tells me more likely where the problems are. And then I just a bit more clear in my mind about what I'm gonna, what I'm going to take. Yeah, I mean, we will come on to balloons in a bit. Um, I, I must say I'm not quite as in love with balloons as I was a few years ago when they came came out. I find that certain situations, they're absolutely fantastic. But when there's a big boggy mass of tissue, you squash it and then it reappears 10 minutes later, sometimes rather worse than it was the first time. But we'll, we'll come on to that. Um, uh, this is just a, um, a picture of another lovely subglottic cyst. This is what I did. Um, and uh, this is... I'd bitten the roof off it with the 2.9 micro debrider, and that's that's the lovely sort of neat job you can do. So that you can see a lovely big cyst cavity and almost no other mucosal trauma. So that's why I like the micro debrider. Uh, clearly, that's the the best result I've had. I'm not showing you the bad ones. But it, it doesn't really matter. Right, here's a good one. Um, another case of Julian's. Uh, so we've got a five-year-old boy who unfortunately had a very large astrocytoma and a big neurosurgical operation, was then intubated for several days afterwards. Uh, in the two, three weeks post-op, he developed progressively worsening stridor. Um, so Julian elected to take him to theatre. Um, Steve, would you like to take us through what the appearances are here? Um, so we're seeing, we are seeing a bit of cord mobility, which is good. He's obviously had neurological intervention. Yeah. And um, we have clearly an evolving subglottic stenosis, don't we? Which is looking like it's a grade three. It's fairly significant, isn't it? Yeah. 
yeah. we're going through it, it looks like it's something you might be able to do something about because it's a, it's a thin band, isn't it? And then you get into what's looking like a normal trachea. Um, so in actual fact, um, whilst this is quite a, a severe stenosis in some ways, if, if the history is quite acute, this is something that could potentially do quite well. Yeah. So what would you do in Newcastle? So you're sitting there in theatre with the suspension, um, and the child's anaesthetised, and the anaesthetist looking at you, anxious to get off to go on his bike ride. Yeah. So I I I, I would balloon this, but I'd I'd start with. So I I, I don't always if it's if it's more circumferential edematous type things. I don't always make incisions, but I would make cold steel incisions, um, Mercedes Benz style. So anterior and then two lateral incisions okay. um, and then and then balloon that and I think it'd do really well. How do you choose the size Initially, of balloon, Steve? Um I look at a sizing chart and just work it out for um the age and it's 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 about one millimeter more than you expect the cricoid. Um, yeah. And uh what sort of pressure do you do you do you blow it up to? Yeah well just whatever it says so they all have a rated pressure and the rated pressure basically tells you what size the balloon goes to so as long as you haven't picked a, a crazy size um, you're going to go to that size so if you, if you go to a rated pressure lower than that then you might not actually achieve the size that you think and so i go to the rated pressure and, and two inflations of 60 seconds okay um, good. for 60 seconds times two times two that seems to be roughly what most people do is is there anybody hannah or, or ravi uh, are you both looking at that itching with your finger on the trigger, ready to get the balloon out as well? Yep, that would have been what I would have done too. <laughs> but we do, we do two minutes. We're really uh, aggressive with our balloon, so two minutes twice. <laughs> and, I'll, and I'll split the difference. Um, so I go 90 seconds, and, and, and certainly yeah. that's what um, Mike Rutter, who did a bit of some um, cadaveric studies on this, decided that that was an optimum length of time to break the fibres. And uh, What did you say, 90 seconds? He said 90 seconds okay. seemed to be the point at which you crossed the tipping point, so you didn't get uh, re-contracture. Uh, uh, I think if I went to two minutes, my this might pass out. So I think, um, and certainly between 60 and 90 seconds, you do need to keep an eye on the color of your anesthetist. But, um, <laughs> uh, and I don't, and in terms, I do like to make cuts as well. I, I, I don't tend to necessarily make them Mercedes-Benz style. I, I think that as you go through the stenosis, you get a sense for, they're often not even, you get a sense for where cuts are going to be most, have a biggest effect. So whether it's one or two or three, yeah. you get a sense for the thin bit and the bit that's most in the airway. And then you kind of have to conceptualize in your mind's eye, if I cut there and then stick a balloon in the middle of this, where am I going to get my results? So that's, and so, yeah, I think the balloons really transform these particular stenosis uh, absolutely uh, and of course julian did exactly that um he uh, got the balloon in there and and that's a, a typical that's after one sort of uh, 60 second go uh and you did two on that i think i did three, three. so, so three, i yeah. tend to do 60 seconds three times i think often it's governed by when they start to desap to be honest so you know um, but yeah, I tend to, I, I don't, yeah, I, I didn't know about um, Mike Rutter's uh, cadaveric ones, but yeah, I, I just picked 60 seconds. It seems, seems a good number. Um, has anybody on the panel seen or heard of anybody blowing up the larynx or trachea with a balloon? Oh, tearing it, basically, is what I'm saying. Anybody? I've had people tell me it's happened, but I've never... Yeah personally been involved or, or sort of had a, a close contact with that. Little stories in the pub sort of thing. Yeah, I mean, I haven't, I don't know if anybody has. Uh, I mean, I, know, I think Mike Rutter and uh, some of the Cincinnati group did try with animal studies in, in the lab and, and they found it was remarkably difficult to actually tear the trachea, um, provided there's not... Got, yeah. Mike, Mike Rutter's got, he's got an uh, interesting video that the a bronchial perforation, isn't it? So when the when they're blowing the bronchi down the lower airway, it's just healed over time. Um, the, the, only, the only other thing I've seen actually was um, a bit of um, somebody was, was was using a balloon and actually caught one of the cords. So you know, it's this sort of sharper bit of the balloon and traumatized the cord. Um, and there's actually a bit of cord loss and a bit of notching. Um, yeah. Um, 
And certainly, yeah, the Broncos, so if you're in the Broncos and you're using a balloon, it's a different ball game. There's loads of case reports of people um, transecting the, the the Broncos. But yeah, in the subglots, I think you're really safe and uh, put your care. Uh, but as you say, yeah, you do have to be careful, particularly second time around. The balloon, the point of the balloon often not quite as straight as it was. Um, and you've got to be a bit more careful as you navigate it through the glottis because you can certainly traumatize the cord. Um, I think the other thing that the Cincinnati people talk a lot about is um, this idea of melon seeding. Um, where uh, if, the, if there is some, uh, if the patient is still breathing, the, you get the sense the balloon is pulling away from you. Um, mm -hmm. And they've seen this where the, uh, the pressure has actually damaged the exit channel of the, the balloon and they've not been able to, 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 to deflate the balloon. So it's just something, and certainly if you've got um, a patient breathing against a balloon, that's probably not a great situation anyway, um, mm -hmm. because of course you can precipitate pulmonary edema, so it's often better just to deflate the balloon, get them a bit more apnea. So um, let's go for the four week post dilatation video. This is a follow up. Let's say this is going to run rather slowly. Um, and you can see that, as, as uh, was mentioned before, you, you don't mend them completely by doing this. You know, there is a, a, there's always a, a little bit of stenosis remaining, and sometimes it comes back and sometimes it needs a, another go once or twice. Julian, do you remember if you needed to do this again or were they asymptomatic? I think I. I think I bloomed them twice and then yeah. the, that was it after that. Okay, yeah. there we go. That's uh, so two balloons, yeah, four weeks post dilatation. Okay, and that's 12 weeks down the line. Um, so, still a what I suppose you'd probably call that a grade one ish. Um, and I think that's where you parked it. Wasn't yeah, it? He, was, he was pretty asymptomatic. So, the, the danger if you keep ballooning is that you can sometimes just make things worse. Um, and so it's just trying to get that right balance between not sort of traumatizing things too much. And um, so I decided not to balloon him after the second ballooning. Um, and, okay. and I haven't heard anything since. And that was probably about a year ago, maybe 18 months. Yeah, and he's, he's done really well. Mm. Okay, very good. Um, let's move on a bit. Now, Hannah, I'm aware that um, you've got to go to work at some stage. Are you okay for time? Yep, got another half an hour or so. I'm good. Half an hour, that's great. And um, Ravi and Steve, I'm aware that you've got to go to bed at some time. Are you okay still? Yeah? Yeah, all good. Yeah. Okay, and in Bristol, obviously, we party all night uh, after we've thrown statues in the, in the canal. Um, <laughs> let's try and um, move on a little bit. Um, yeah, this is... Um, this is one I don't necessarily need you to comment on. Uh, this is just to say, this is uh, uh, a, 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 an illustration of the fact that it just doesn't always work. You know, it doesn't always go the way you, you, you plan. Uh, so here's a child with a little bit of intubation trauma the first time around, um, which was, uh, I don't think we actually did anything about it the first time around. The second um, go isn't running. Um, but he had a balloon dilatation the second go. That's the third go. I'm sorry these videos aren't really running. I think the computer's overwhelmed. Um, but this is, so this is a child who's had intubation trauma from being a prem and has had two balloon dilatations, but it is getting progressively worse despite balloon dilatation. Um, anybody had that experience in children before? Where rather than making it better, you seem to be making it worse. I suppose the big question is, are you really making it worse or is this just the natural history of what's going to happen anyway yeah. and your balloon's just not making it better? That's a very kind um, comment, Hannah. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> That's not what it felt like at the time, but it is possible, yeah. Do you think there are any patient factors that, that uh, would predispose a child to this sort of thing? I mean, what, what do you think about reflux? You know, the, the, the standard blame everything thing in ENT is gastroesophageal reflux. Um, do you think that would possibly cause this? Personally, I doubt it, but I don't know what you think. I mean, I, they, they're all on a PPI, or at least in my hands, they're generally on a PPI, but I agree, I'm not convinced it always makes a lot of difference, but I'd certainly be treating them with a PPI. I think lower airway disease is often a part of it as well. So, um, you know, chronic infection. Um, yeah. Sometimes azithromycin or, or just or just tailoring your anti some antibiotics to whatever they're growing in their lower airways can be useful, but I'm usually suspicious there's a, some inflammatory process going on in their lower airways as well. Yeah. 
Okay, Steve, what if you if you had this scenario where you were serially ballooning uh, what you thought was a stenosis or what was a stenosis and it was was apparently getting worse? What would you do here? Yeah, how, how old the child? Um, let's go back for a minute. They, they were probably about six months at this about sort six of time. Months of age, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's very difficult, isn't it? And I, th I think, yeah, it, it, try and sort out as much as you can. Treat the reflux, optimize medically, um, and then and then it's, it's it's quite a difficult conversation, isn't it? Is is there a bit of glottic level involvement there as well as subglottic, a little, or a little bit actually? But I think this one had a, a left vocal cord palsy as well. Oh, fine, I didn't tell you that. Yeah. But but the subglottis is just getting worse. Yeah. So that picture on the right is the subglottis. So the child yeah. was, you know, not was responding very short period after each balloon, getting worse quicker and quicker. So we we, we decided yeah. we'd have to intervene, and and the only interventions that we we could we consider would be a tracheostomy or an LTL. Yeah. So we yeah. went for a single stage anterior uh, graft LTR, um, which. I suppose, in retrospect, you might be surprised to hear it didn't really work terribly well. Um, initially, when we pulled the tube out, the graft looked in a very nice place, um, but then it started narrowing down. There you are, just below the graft at four weeks, um, and it, it essentially got worse and worse. And I'm sorry, these videos aren't working out terribly well, but, but effectively it wound up with a tracheostomy. Um, and we put a tracheostomy in and sat on it for uh, two years, and we've just looked back in. It's now a much more organized stenosis. I'm sorry you can't see the pictures terribly well. Um, it's one of the sort of hard stenoses, which now I imagine might respond to an LTR a bit better. I mean, Ravi, do you think that we, you know, I would criticize myself here for not predicting the outcome of the LTR. This, some people talk about children who are just reactive and they keep scarring and they keep swelling. And if you do an LTR, that's not going to go very well either. Do you think that's a reasonable point? Should I have just gone for the trackie? Um, so did you, um, so when you say LTR, I presume you're talking about a thyroid ala graft or did you, is, or did oh, you no, use I costal cartilage? Do, so we do an anterior cricoid split, re-intubate with an age-appropriate tube and put a bit of costal cartilage in. Oh, okay, so, fine. Yeah. yeah, I think, well, I, 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 yeah, I have to say, I, in that age group, I would have generally done an endoscopic cricoid split. Um, just because it's so much quicker and, you know, just, you know, in that age group, I, 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 I tend to just, that's just tend to, tends to be my go-to. I know it's going to fail, it's going to fail, and then you go to a tracky. So that, that, in, in my eyes, I think that's probably what I, where, where I would have gone okay. to, even though he's not, you know, he's, he was six months old. Um, by this, think, yes. by this, by this stage, he's, 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 I think he's still under a year, but he's, yeah. he's sort of, yeah, about nine months by the time he did the LTR, I think. Yeah, I, so I tried, I've just always not really gone for costal cartilage in, in that age group. I've typically done an endoscopic split. I've sometimes done a, an open split with a thyroid graft and then moved to tracheostomy. Those have all failed. Um, so that's probably what, what I would have done. Um, but, you know, you just roll, you roll the dice, isn't it? I think it's, yeah. it's always worth a shot, isn't it? And I think you, 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 having a tracheostomy for a couple of years isn't necessarily huge fun. So um, I think it's definitely worth, worth a shot. Steve, would you have, say he'd been serially failing these balloon dilatations? Would you have done something like an LTR or? A yeah, well, I think I think you just have to counsel the parents, don't you? Which I'm sure you did, which is present them with those options. Which is, you know, the, the, the tracheostomy, you know, would work as a tracheostomy, but it's a huge burden on the family and comes with the consequences. Plus, one of the things about the tracheostomy is you then leave evolving disease above it. So, you know, it sounds like the stenosis hasn't worsened horribly here, but you could get horribly worsening stenosis that, that needs more attention. Yeah. So there are, you know, there's downsides to a tracheostomy. So, and then the family have to then balance that out in operation that might not work. And with it being a left core palsy, quite reactive larynx. You know, yeah. I guess, I guess, you know, it's, it's, it's one that hasn't had a great outcome, but I, I, I think if, if ever a lot of families would have been in that position with that discussion, you know, it would be attractive to try something that could be done, you know, with a degree of safety, I think. I completely agree. I think they nearly always do that, you know, that you you discuss the idea of a tracheostomy of the families and they do almost anything to avoid one. Um, yes. That was a bit complicated to start with. Hannah, would you have gone for something fairly significant like an LTR? <laughs> Look, I, I think 
probably in our centre with a under six monther who's obviously had a stormy course already, or he has a vocal cord palsy. In retrospect, I'd probably say I'd just go to a trackie. Um, yeah. I mean, it's, it's hard to say. Um, I, obviously, you're guided by your family as well, but um, you know, a trackie's safe. You can get them out of hospital. Yes, it's not ideal, is it, for the family at home? But you know, you've got a safe airway um, while you wait for everything for the child to grow. Um, so I, I think I probably would have gone tracky, but it, you know, I could have been pushed the other way as well for exactly the same reasons that you're talking about. Okay, that, that, that's fine. Um, just before we go any further, we have a, a question typed in from a Mr. Quo of Birmingham who asks if we are, if anybody is using cutting balloons. I mean, I've certainly heard of them. I've not, I've seen them with the reps. Uh, for people who don't know, these are basically balloons with tiny little blades embedded with them and they cut through the fibrous tissue. They, they sort of do the Mercedes-Benz incision for you. Anybody use them? Steve, I mean, you're the real expert on balloons. Yeah, well, not really. No, I don't. But <laughs> I have some data on balloons. But yeah, the, um, yeah the, nobody did. So in the, in the prospective UK study of, you know, 130-odd balloons, there was nobody used the cutting angio balloons. Um, and I, I've looked at them, but... I, I, I would rather do, if I was going to do incisions, but like Ravi said, because, you know, not being too prescriptive about it, you can actually have a little look and start the incision yourself because it's almost, you're making a release point. You're trying to control the way the tissue tears is effectively what an incision is. I just think you've got more control of that if you do it in two stages rather than try and do it all in a one, would be my view. Okay. All right, good. Um, let's move on. Uh, we're still good. Um, this is a this is a really interesting case. Um, so I am not in the hospital, but um, I get called because the general surgeons have taken a, a very new baby to theatre um, because it has an imperfect anus and they want to do something to its colon, um, and it, it it didn't have any other real visible uh, abnormalities, although you'll be aware that you know a child a newborn with an imperfect anus may well have other things but it it had a normal chest x-ray and no cardiac abnormalities as far as they could be uh certain no real airway abnormalities preoperatively but they were unable to intubate with any of the tubes they could find in the anesthetic room um and urgent call put out for ent um and i was the unlucky one who was closest to the hospital so i went in and did an mlb um which may or may not play. I don't think it's going to play rather sadly. Um, what this shows um, is basically a congenital anterior subglottic stenosis. And the, uh, the distal airway was a little bit malasic, but essentially not bad. This um, stenosis was relatively thin. It wasn't like a membrane, it was, you know, maybe three millimeters, but that's what it was. The glottis and the supraglottis were normal. Um, so they obviously had to intubate it or get an airway of some sort um, to, to, to proceed with surgery and, uh, and post-op care. So um, I'm in a slightly difficult position here because obviously the, the safe answer is to just get on and do a tracheostomy and worry about that later. But the slightly more racy answer is that you're going to go in and do an acute cricoid split and put in an age appropriate tube and maybe find some cartilage to go in uh, and, and see how you go. And of course, um, it's not a very big operation. People think a, a, an LTL is a big operation. It's not really that big an operation to just expose the cricoid and the, the anterior thyroid cartilage and then to get a little bit of thyroid ala out there and stitch it in. So. Um, who would who would go for the LTR cricoid split approach, and who would go for the tracky in this scenario? Ravi, you're first. Yeah, no brainer. Cricoid endoscopic cricoid split. Endoscopic, okay. I, now my feeling is that that was quite thick, and I'm not. I mean, yes, it might have done it. Um, Steve. Yeah, and I, and I I think you're right about doing something in the more ratio option. And I think the more you've done, the more I've done over time the more i just want to correct the problem straight away yeah. um but but i think it needs to be open because i think that i think that anterior web is is not just a, a thin web and i think i i find when it, when i've done these that i i actually end up taking out a bit of cartilage 
that forms yeah. the anterior actually almost carve it out to create a new anterior commissure yeah um, and, a, and a bit of a point and then put the graft high up within that and that that's the best chance of not getting a, a blunting and a web i think yeah that, that's good um hannah mm. could, you, well, could you get any tube through it could you get a two and a half through it or no, two or uh, anything through it I, I think they, did they, um, they may have, they may have got a two through it you know one of those things that look like a feeding tube yeah, yeah. barely ventilate yeah. through and the first molecule yeah. of, of phlegm comes along and the thing gets blocked up yeah so yeah not a um, yeah i mean i would agree that the cricoid is going to be very abnormal in this child it's um, going to be very thickened there um less maybe less is more at the beginning maybe maybe it's reasonable to do a endoscopic split and intubate it and see what kind of result you get out of that it's it's, it's quicker isn't it potentially um, and then have a chat to the family. But um, it's interesting, the, fam the child's been doing well up until now, it uh, yeah. hasn't had any airway problems. And I certainly have some, you know, very significant webs who are completely asymptomatic and you can only get a two and a half tube through them and try not to do anything to them for as long as possible. So, yeah, uh, well, it, it, it was pretty clear that we were going to have to do something. Yeah. So, so anyway, I, I'd obviously, um, I was obviously in a good mood that day, feeling up for a bit of action. So I, I, uh, I did a single stage uh, open procedure. So, and, and it was, it was really straightforward. I exposed the anterior uh, thyroid cartilage and cryocoid trachea, made a slit. We put an age appropriate tube in, which I think was a three and a half that went in reasonably easily. And then I filled this in with a bit of thyroid ala stitched in and left it intubated for seven days. I mean, the thing would have probably been intubated overnight anyway, so I didn't feel it was too bad. And I'm very pleased to say that it actually, you're not going to be able to see the, the awesome majesty of the graph that I got in there. But it, it looked like Michelangelo had painted it on. It looked so good, which is slightly unusual for Bristol, obviously. Um, and, and I'm pleased to say the child has subsequently done very well. You, you know, I think I took it back. Um, a few weeks later, and there was a little bit of a mild grade one, but but asymptomatic. Parents were very pleased, and and, and so was I, because um, you know sometimes these things work really well, and you feel very clever. And sometimes, despite doing a beautiful operation like like the previous LTR, they just don't work. Um, good. So I, I think I'm probably going to let you all off with with um, with that. Um, what do you think, Julian? Do you want to go and talk about HJ? You uh, it's up to you. It's your patient. I think okay. it's your patient. Yeah. Okay. Well. Okay. We. Um, the only problem is even on the even on the big computer, the um, the the actual uh, videos have stopped. So I'm I'm um, I'm probably not going to 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 talk about individual cases anymore. Um, I'm, I'm aware that there may be a a, a range of different trainees uh, watching. Um, some of whom are you know fellows or senior trainees who know exactly all the long words we're using some of whom don't. So this is a picture of a cricoid split. And a, a cricoid split is essentially um, where you make a vertical incision just below the anterior commissure of the vocal cords, through the anterior arch of the cricoid into the upper tuticle rings um, when you have a, a stenosis. And then you re-intubate it with uh, an age-appropriate tube, quite a decent sized tube, and you don't do anything else. You just leave it like that, intubated for seven to 10 days. And the idea is the soft tissue fills in that gap. Um, Dave Albert used to tell me that he felt that it allowed the edema to get out of the intact ring of the cricoid. But you don't put a graft in. Um, now, some people do a lot of these, and it's generally an operation that is done in, in, in very small children. I must say, I've, I've not had a great deal of success with these. The first one I tried developed a tracheocutaneous fistula, which I felt really embarrassed about. Ravi, do you do, you do a formal cricoid split like this? I know you talked about the endoscopic one. Uh, yeah, so I, 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 do, I do for failed endoscopics because I think it's such an easy, quick operation. Uh, yeah. And then if I go to an open, I always use a thyroid ala graft, um, which I think, you know, you're there. You don't really have to expose anything. You don't have to get involved with the ribs. So I think, yeah, and, and a thyroid ala is great. You know, it's incredibly easy to harvest. It can be a bit thin sometimes and sometimes gets a bit wobbly, but, but I really like it. I, so I, if, I do an, if I'm going to do an open split, uh, by and large, I'll, I'll put a piece of thyroid ala in there. And, and, and of course, as soon as you put a graft in, it becomes a single stage LTR, you know, it's, it, it, effectively, doesn't it? It's the same operation, just with a graft. Um, Steve, do you do the old-fashioned open split without a graft? Yeah, well, that's the last one I did, and the last one was several years ago, and I was 
I was trying to think why it had been so long, and I think because the balloons and the way we intervene and all these things we were talking about with granulation, it's it just, I, I'm ready to do one, um, but they're just, the cases haven't come, and I, we, we're not yeah. putting trackies in because we're giving up, but we're actually just, we're managing as, as Julian and you've done to do the reason jobs and get them through these little stormy paths I think so I haven't had to resort to this for about seven years but I, the last one I did was open um, but yeah I, I can see the merits of endoscopic it's the balloon that's path. changed it I'm sure you're right Ravi are you doing a lot of endoscopic splits it sounds like you are from just from the way you talk um, you know, I don't know what a lot is but I, it, in the scenarios we discussed I, I think it's a real kind of low risk yeah. high impact uh, you know operation it doesn't always work you just you have to have an incredibly sharp sickle knife for it to work and we use a disposable sickle knife in sheffield that we got a company to make for us and they sell it they call it the sheffield acs knife andrew crackwood split knife and it's oh, yeah. cost a fiver um and i think that's that's why the operation works you just have to have an unbelievably sharp disposable sickle knife and if you've got that i think i i really think it's really quick and easy and so i do that's my go-to obviously uh, so I do do that is that is my go to I think and then with an open if they fail and yeah. the track if they fail. Hannah, what what's your favourite operation? Well, I'm not the same as you guys. We just haven't seen a lot of kids needing to go to these kind of operations more recently. Mm. Uh, I was just thinking about the last time we had a situation like this, and I I must say I put a graft in. Um, you know, could have probably would have got away with just a cricoid split. To tell you the truth, I'm not sure if the gra what the graft added whatsoever, but it seemed like a fun idea at the time. Um, endoscopically, we've I've got we haven't got a lot of experience. Um, you certainly used it posteriorly to put in posterior grafts endoscopically, and we've got a, a beaver blade works quite nicely, a long handed beaver blade, and and mm -hmm. that just cuts through like butter endoscopically, which is beautiful. Um, so. Um, just just the cases seem to not be occurring as much perhaps yeah. as they used to and balloons also are better and we're managing things more endoscopically but when can i just ask the panel where do you take your alar cartilage from mike you able to go back to that slide um, um just go up yes is it is it do you take a sort of a window out of the alar or do you take the top part of the uh, alar where do you take your cartilage where do you harvest your cartilage from can't find the Sorry. <laughs> yeah, do I you, think I might have a picture of it. Let me there we are. Do, do, you, do you do it like in this photo or? This is the Monnier book, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Do, does everybody take the, the thyroid ailer from there or do you take a bit from the middle? Um, yeah, so I, I take it exactly as it's described in that picture. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. okay. But now going back to the business about grafts or just open splits, I just think if you've, if, uh, sometimes the, the, if you imagine the cricoid ring wanting to close down again, I think if you stick a graft in there, it kind of holds it open. And I also think that if you can get a, an almost airtight seal with the cartilage, it, it reduces the amount of inflammation you get post-op. But, but th th there are people who are big fans of the open cricoid splits and some people who aren't. So, uh, you know, there isn't necessarily a right answer. Um, and, of course, this is the traditional thing where you get a bit of rib cartilage, which is a lovely big, piece of rib which I quite like and you just suture it in and it, it holds the cricoid open very well so that's a single stage LCR. Anyway. Okay guys thanks very much that was really good fun as always. I'll uh, see you soon. <laughs>